Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges as he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Paul. Our guest today, Ellie Gould, is a specialist in making the kinds of changes in life that are both valuable and lasting. In fact, she has created a process to help each of us understand who we truly want to be, how we might get there, and then, most importantly, how we can stay there. Ellie Gould makes a compelling argument for the use of feeling our way into success in our left brain sort of thinking-oriented world Our feelings are often regarded as an enemy or roadblock to success. Instead, Ellie advocates the power of your emotions in her successful book promoted by Tony Robbins titled Feeling Forwards, and it's uh, the author is Elizabeth Gould. I I will be calling her Ellie, but her author's name is Elizabeth Gould, and it has this very notable subtitle that I like, How to Become the Person who has the life you want. Today, Ellie will use the lessons and learnings from her book to walk us down the path of making changes that stick. Just a sentence on Ellie. She is a best-selling author, an entrepreneur, personal reinvention coach, and she has worked with Tony Robbins and with Randy Zuckerberg. So with that, let's bring on our special guest, Ellie Gould. Welcome back to the next chapter with Charlie. Oh, thank you, Charlie. This is such a treat to hang out with you and Paul again. (laughs) I think we should probably tell everybody that they've already picked up on that you're Australian, but that we are making, you are not here. We are making the long distance call from Australia to, um, or from California to Australia. Now, this is already Friday for you, isn't it? It is. It's like you're. It's like you're speaking to the the future already. <laughs> oh my goodness! Don't get me, don't get me going on time constructs and time travel. I'm really into that in my sci-fi books. So I'll get distracted with time issues. So Ellie, you know, as I've been reading and talking to you, I have to tell you that you are so quotable. Here's um, here's a quote that I love. And I think it may be the core of our discussion today. You have stated, I love this, Ellie, if you feel good about yourself, you're going to make good decisions. If you don't feel good about yourself, another story. Um, This is a huge and I think ultra dynamic truth. Um, um, Let's talk more about that. What, explain your, your, your rationale behind if you feel good, about yourself, you're going to make good decisions. I think it's so true, but I, I want your take on it. Oh, look, I love that you asked me about this up front, Charlie, because there's a, a common misconception, and particularly uh, rife in the in treatments for addiction and recovery, is that you know you have to hit rock bottom, and once you hit rock bottom, you have this kind of epiphany that you can make all these major changes to change your life. And look, we've all hit rock bottom in some way or another in our lives and, and decided to change. But I approach it differently because I think you can you can create lasting change from a powerful position, from a positive position. So for example, when I'm talking with, with clients about making changes that stick, the first thing, we don't go through everything they're not doing. We don't go through everything on their to-do list that's still outstanding because let's face it, that makes you human. What we go through is we identify 20 things that they're proud of. They could be small things. They could be things, personal attributes. They could be something they've done in the last year. And while they're focused on everything that they are doing right and they have done and they have a strong sense of self-esteem, it's like, okay, well, let's how can we take this further what changes can we make what do you want to how do you want to move towards becoming the person who has the life you want rather than well you you totally suck at this and you're not doing that right and and really you could have done more in this area that's not going to inspire anyone to create lasting personal change i think that is so powerful if you don't feel good about yourself you're coming at it from a perspective of I need salvation. I'm trying to I'm trying to save my life, recover my life from 
some sort of terrible circumstance, when you come out of feeling good about yourself, you're more inclined to have a positive, a positive, you know, impression or 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 feeling about what the future may be. I, 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 I do think you're onto it now. You know, of course, you know when you hit bottom, people who are who are addicted and you know alcoholics or drug addicts or drug users. You know, it does take a bottom. You know, it does take a. You've hit it, and you you know you, you your 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 addiction or your drug or your alcohol has taken you to a place where you can't live anymore. So there is a place for that. I don't think we're saying there's not a place for that, but that saying for the great majority of people, you don't have to hit bottom to make changes. You can be at the very top of your game and make changes. Absolutely. And you don't have to define what's what's wrong about yourself before you decide what changes you want to make. I mean, one thing that, Charlie, you and I love geeking about is um, geeking out about is high performance in sport and the lessons that have that has for everyone else who wants to achieve something great. And my own beautiful football team at home in Melbourne, the Richmond Tigers, hadn't won the premiership or the Super Bowl equivalent for you know, 27 years and they took a good long hard look at themselves and, and they had a coach who was relatively new and the, it just wasn't working I mean the results were terrible and, and the coach said you know can we just dig up the files of all the players and we, can we look at the original reason why we drafted them why did we hire them in the first place and they looked back at all these players and realised that over time and, and one of the coaches wasn't so great in the past but Over time, they had taken someone who maybe good was fantastic at offense because we don't have offense and defense teams, but maybe he was really good in one position, but someone got injured, so they moved them to another position. And they realized that they they ended up with a team that was playing catch-up and mismatched because they weren't all playing to their strengths. So they said, okay, we're going going back. We're starting over again. We hired this guy because he was really good at this. Okay, let's keep making him even better at that rather than focusing on well we've put him in this position and it's not working so let's just make him work harder or give him you know yell at him or or give him tougher training and I think we can do that with ourselves sometimes we can beat ourselves up for, for something we haven't done usually it's because we're not that great at it anyway and it could be that it's not our natural style or personality and we can try to do something until, as we say in Australia, the cows come home and it's never going to work. So starting with making lasting change or working towards that great big dream you have, look at where you succeeded in other areas. Look at where you are great and let's just let's just increase that by one, two, three percent. And then the changes are truly extraordinary. You know, you know, there's an assessment and there's several assessments that are working on the positive aspect of life, but... You know the one. Are you familiar? You're, I'm sure you're familiar with Strengths Finders, um, mm-hmm. and they focus on your strengths and understanding that you have, let's call them non-strengths, that are areas and and typically in business coaching and executive coaching, what what we used to do 30 years ago is that we would take your non-strengths and say, how can we make your non-strengths better? How can we how can yeah. we take you and move you up move you up so you're so you're evenly balanced? And now I think there's a lot of a lot of um um growth specialists that are saying, no, that's not the answer. The answer is let's focus our attention on what we do best, and if we focus on that, we're going to succeed and we find other people, other means to take care of our non-strengths. Um, I, 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 I so agree with what you're saying. I think it's, I think it's the way to go. Mm. And, and look, playing to something that you, you have already started, you've already started a form of achievement, once again is, is a form of self-esteem that moves you forward. I have, I have clients who, who want to embrace a more structured morning routine and there is a I wouldn't say it's a myth but there is a conception that the ultimate morning routine follows A, B, C, D and it's usually got a workout component and maybe some journaling and reflection and your your morning routine is amazing but some people 
it doesn't work for them. And I had one client who was just really struggling with this. And I said, look, how about, I said, what would you really like to do in the morning? He said, well, I don't get enough time to read. I said, okay, I don't care if you set your alarm and you read one chapter of War and Peace every single morning because it's your goal to finish that book. Because the magic of the morning routine isn't what you do. It's the fact that you show up consistently. He said, can I really do that? Is that, that a good morning routine? I said, yeah, it's a good morning routine for you because you fulfill one of your goals, you follow through, you feel proud of yourself, you show up consistently, so yeah. And he found he could effortlessly absorb a different and earlier, more powerful morning routine because he was doing something that really, really resonated with him. Whereas I don't think I, even if I picked him up in my car at four o'clock in the morning and taken him to the gym myself and that was that was never going to work <laughs> yeah you, you know i w- i want to get on to that morning routine you have a you have a coffee example that i want to talk about later that i think is just really a brilliant idea that you mm. had um, but you know before we do that we we talked about a powerful paradigm that you have established around the idea of be and do and have. That first, it has to do with we need to understand who we are, what we consist of. We need to act on that. And the acting on who we are internally, our strengths, and even our non-strengths, you know, we, we, can, we can pay attention to. But if we, we pay attention to our strengths... That gives us the the power, the momentum, the the drive, and and wherewithal to do what we believe we are, and that results in us having the re- or, and, and in the end, the the reward is that we have what we're trying to to accomplish. Can you? I I know I, I probably I probably screwed that whole thing up. So let's have the experts. The expert, tell me what that's about. (laughs) No, not at all. That was a great summary. What I love to do with my success coaching and reinvention coaching with entrepreneurs who can quite easily get stuck and um, disheartened is look at how um, an athlete approaches success because there's so much we can learn from elite sport and they approach success backwards from the way that most entrepreneurs or anyone with a dream approaches it and, and let me explain what a what an athlete does or a potential athlete is they actually live like a world champion before and, and, and you were talking elite athletes at this point point right well really anyone who wants to be an athlete anyone who okay. has a dream to win a medal or a local so if you want to I'll, I'll give you the reverse example let's say you go to visit a friend and their teenage son or daughter is at home and you ask those really thrilling adult questions like what are you doing <laughs> what are you aiming for what do you want to achieve in life and and the, the teenager says oh I really want to be a professional sports person and you go okay great what, what sport do you play and they go oh, look, oh, look I'm doing a few I haven't really decided yet but <laughs> I, I reckon when I've won a few races I'll, I'll get a coach then and then I'll start to train really hard and eat right and do all those things and you would walk away and very politely and think, well, they absolutely have no hope. Because anyone who wants to be a professional sports person, they, they train, they get a coach, they sleep and they eat right before they've won their first race. But entrepreneurs and a lot of the rest of us think, okay, when I've made my first million dollars, when my widget is, is for sale across the world, when my app has been downloaded 100,000 times, then I'll get a personal trainer, I'll get in shape. Then I'll have enough money to hire a finance guy and get that under control. And then once I've got all this success, then I'll be a really great person and I'll be happy. And it doesn't work that way. It's, it's the athlete's example of you become the person who has the life you want. So you become the person that has the success before the success arrives. And that's a really common theme in every biography or autobiography you will read in every walk of life. You know, can I give you a couple examples? My son is a professional baseball player in the United States and in the big leagues. And um, 
when he was 10 years old, his mom said, what do you want to do when you grow up? And he says, I'm going to be a professional baseball player. And he's 10, Ellie, he's 10. And she says, well, you know, that's a great choice, you know, and she doesn't want to dishearten him by saying, you know, the chances are between slim and and none that you would be a professional baseball player, even though he was an extraordinarily talented athlete. She said, what should, what is your, what would, if you couldn't be a baseball player, what would you be? And he just looked at her, you know, almost like an adult and said, mom, you don't understand. There is no alternative. I'm going to be a professional baseball player. And that was in his mind at 10 years old and he was drafted right out of high school. He didn't even go to college. He was drafted by a mm. professional baseball team right out of high school. And that was because he was being before having. This was Absolutely. This was who he was. And then I want to give another example from a film that <laughs> yeah, I saw Babylon and so I'm just going to let all the audience you know, determine what they want to determine about Babylon because it's a different film. But in the film, Margot Robbie, um, and and Australian um, um, Marvel, by the way, Margot Robbie is asked uh, at at one point in the film. Um, so, what are you? She says, "I'm a star." And the guy she was talking to says, "Well." What movies have you been in that, that have made you a star? And she said, you don't understand. You don't become a star. You are a star. You are a star before you even begin. And that's what I am. I'm a star before I even began. Even, and, and she then became a star. But it was, um, um, now, it doesn't all have happy endings, but that's what makes a movie a movie. But, but, but I like that idea. You don't become a star. You are a star. You don't become a professional mm -hmm. baseball player in your mind. You are a uh, professional baseball player. And, and that, that sort of illustrates your point, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, you were already that champion. I mean, Muhammad Ali was very, very famous for saying he was, oh. he was the greatest before he was. But it, it's, that, it's that discipline. I, um, have, my, my son was very talented at sport, but didn't choose that route, but he was his best friend and another close friend were off the charts talented and they were always destined for a career in sport and they were number one and number two in our NFL draft pick a couple of years ago across the country. But I watched them grow up and from the age of 10, once again, they were competing at a state level. They were going away on camps during holidays. They weren't going to birthday parties or they were leaving parties early because they had training the next morning. Their their whole life was structured. And when they got drafted, their lives actually didn't change that much because they'd been behaving like Austin. And was, I'm a huge fan of your son. Like Austin, they'd been behaving like that way for years. But entrepreneurs, I, I love working with them to understand that when their, their widget or their app has whatever success they're planning, they need to become that person who's comfortable with that before it happens because otherwise they, they aren't prepared for the success. They're not prepared for the extraordinary demands on your time. When you earn a lot more money, your time gets a lot smaller. So if you can't manage it before the success, you certainly can't manage it afterwards. And uh, one thing breaks my heart is seeing really talented entrepreneurs break out or, or burn out way too early so there's a lot about the the behavior the successful behavior always comes before the success itself the successful behavior and and perhaps even the successful mindset that you have this 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 in, internal drive that this is what you're going to do now you talk about that and, and we'll just hit this very briefly you talk about that there is an opposite route that you believe in the B, you know, I am a star, I am a professional baseball player, then you do, then you have. But you pointed out to me that so many people take the opposite route that they want to have first, do, and that determines who they are. That determines the B. Yeah. And you say that's completely opposite, backward, and doesn't really work. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's a very fast route to, to burnout or feeling... Um, 
on the outside looking successful and feeling incredibly miserable on the inside. So that um, the, the have is when uh, someone thinks, well, when, um, and even in your personal life, some people think, well, when I have a big house, and two kids, and then I'm I'm doing this incredible job. Then I'll become unbelievably happy. And sadly, and that you're in your 40s and 50s, and we see relationships fall apart at that age group all the time. That's not the way it, it works. And I think financial success is attributed with happiness in the the have to be model. But sometimes it works. Sometimes having your widget sold across the world is enough to make people happy but it's not a cause and effect you have to have the feelings of success and confidence that will carry you through right to the end you don't have an external event like a business success that automatically guarantees you're going to become a very happy person you know and i think that has uh, I, w- I was going to ask you questions how do you attain that but i think i think you 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 address that to a large degree in your book, Feeling Forwards. And so just before we go deeply and spend our time into making changes that stick, I'd like to have you know just a, a, a brief discussion about some of the ideas in your popular book, um, Feeling Forwards. In the book, you talk about the powerful use of feelings in a thinking-oriented world. And now, I so agree with this. And, you know, I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's both. But I think we have so ignored the feelings that we need to put maybe a more special attention on that. You know, the left brain, right brain concept. Can you talk to me about the use of feelings in a thinking-oriented world and what Feeling Forwards is all about? Yes, well, look, uh, this is something I absolutely love talking about because this is actually, uh, I learned and I uncovered the technique I called Feeling Forwards in a, over a long period of time because my first book that was published was called Secrets of Cancer Survivors. And after I had my own cancer journey, which no I didn't, enjoyed, I didn't know I, about that. Oh, really? Oh, well, I'm so glad you've asked me a question that's going to uncover something new for everyone. But... I had written books for years, murder mysteries that absolutely everyone hated. So I'd written about 10 or 11 books that were just clearly, truly horrible. And then I got (laughs) cancer and I realized there was a gap in the market because there were lots of single stories, which were lovely, and lots of books about diets and meditation, which is great. But no one had written about the thinking patterns of cancer survivors. And I thought, okay, I know what I had to do to think my way through it. Is that unique? So I interviewed a whole range of cancer survivors, different cancers, ages, genders, stages, and found there was a common thinking pattern. But what what came about was it wasn't the positive thinking that you would think that is so often told unwittingly, not very helpfully to, to someone who has cancer, but it was how the cancer survivors actually controlled their emotions and how they generated feelings of confidence that they would make it through that was one of the standouts. So... I was ruminating on that and then I thought, okay, well, what what other kind of group of people can I look at that overcome incredible challenges? And I decided to look at childhood because so many books about raising children and child parenting techniques are written by psychologists and it struck me that psychologists see kids who aren't coping. So there must be somewhere out there a group of kids that are coping So do they have a thinking and feeling pattern that's different from the children that are in all these books? So I consulted with some a group of teachers as to whether or not firstly they could identify a child who was intrinsically happy no matter what. And they said, absolutely. So I interviewed a range of children um, under the age of 12 and talked to them about their lives and they'd all been bullied. There were some that were adopted, some that were only children, big families, middle kids, young kids different socioeconomic groups Um, and I found once again it was the ability to control or generate feelings of happiness and confidence and I remember one little girl she was nine she looked at me like I was you know slightly deluded adult and said well I choose when I'm happy that's within my control at nine years old said that Um, yeah unreal So then I took a break and and started a number of businesses with my my husband, had my own entrepreneurial journey. And then 
then when I when I started working with Randy Zuckerberg at Zuckerberg Institute, which was her leadership school, she had a couple of years ago. Then I really started to uncover. I made the link between athletic performance. And choosing your emotions, and really feeling forwards in its essence is the ability to to feel ahead, to create the future you want, but not through just thinking about it, because thinking alone doesn't work, but feeling as though that future you want is real, and then working your way backwards into the present. So you do behave today as though your future has already occurred, which makes it it happen. That's where your favourite, the time travel, comes in. No, today is the past of our future. Yeah, I, I, I love. Again, I say you're so quotable. I love that statement. Today is, today is the past. We have to think. Today is the past of your future. We have to think. In thinking of future, today is past. Today, in the future, today is already past. And so that means, that means, taking the quote that I've used. My my listeners are very familiar with this, but. You are who you have been becoming. What you were mm. suggesting is that what you are today, you, who you have been becoming, begins today, and then tomorrow it's past. It's part of the past, but it 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 continues forward, and it continues these habits forward, and that we 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 start today, and we start creating habits and changes and. And goals and objectives and and you know and I'm not thinking monetarily monetary goals. I'm thinking of I'm thinking of internal goals and and those goals of of happiness and love and kindness and service and all of those sorts of things that really do matter in life and and if we just focus on material material changes, you know that's I, I don't think that's rarely does that satisfy. Yes. Because, it, I mean, we, we also spoke about this the other day, but wherever you go, there you are. You, you are intrinsically the, the same person. I interviewed uh, Kerry Walsh Jennings recently, who is that amazing um, uh, beach volleyball Olympian from the States. And she talks about, she was a quote from the interview, that she loves who she becomes in pursuit of her dreams. And that's very much that whole kind of future idea that, it's not I love who I am when I've achieved my dreams because that is that pursuit and, and being being who you are and taking that into the future is, is always happening. I think that's powerful. You know what I want to do, Ellie, is uh, I want to move on to our subject, and that is how to make changes, how to make life changes that stick. And uh, before we get there, I think it's time for us to take a brief break, and then we'll come back and we'll jump right into the heart and the meat of what we're trying to get about today. Awesome. Hi there, this is Charlie Hedges, and you are listening to the next chapter with Charlie. And I have incredible awesome consultant entrepreneur thinker elizabeth ellie gould who has a fabulous book feeling forwards that's that is promoted by tony robbins and randy zuckerberg but we are going to talk today we've been talking about her book feeling forwards and about the power of feeling about the power of thinking positively you make, if you feel good about yourself, you make good decisions. Um, we we're talking in that line. Now Now we're going to kind of do a little bit of a, of, of a move in, to talk about making life changes that stick. Ellie is, this is Ellie's sort of new, new philosophy or new, or new road that she's, She's heading down, and you know, Ellie. I think this is so relevant in our culturally, and you know, the Australian and American culture are not they're they're distinct, but they're not totally different. And that we both have mm-hmm. this growth-oriented mindset, and it is so easy to say 
that I am going to make a change. And then I might even live with those changes for a few days or even a couple of months. But how in the world can I make those changes last? And that is what your expertise is today. I, I, w- I would love to hear what you have to say about that. Oh, look, thank you. That's a lovely, that's a lovely lead-in because I think, well, that's the problem. When most people think about making a change, they just think about it. They don't feel the impact of the change itself. And let's say, let's, taking up, let's just take up getting up earlier again because that, that's one of the universal New Year's resolutions or, you know, my life will be easier if I could squeeze an extra hour, hour and a half in, whether that's time for myself or, or, or time for work. So when someone decides they want to get up, let's say an hour earlier every morning, they they might just turn their alarm to an hour earlier. They tell themselves, I'm getting up an hour earlier in the morning. And that's pretty much the preparation. And this is where the challenge of what I call flabby imagination comes in. I love this flabby it, imagination. <laughs> we have to We have to chat about that, but go ahead. Yeah, because when you're thinking, particularly about making a change, and remember, you're thinking about something that is unfamiliar, and your brain really doesn't like unfamiliar because your brain is not designed for personal development. Your brain is designed to keep you safe. So if you spent yesterday eating carbs and watching Netflix all day on the couch, the brain thinks that's a pretty good day because nothing happened to you, nothing bad happened, you were quite safe, you know, it's really safe on the couch, you you might have fallen off when you fell asleep, but that's about the worst thing that can happen, so when you then decide, okay, I'm getting up an hour earlier tomorrow morning, it feels unfamiliar, which the brain then interprets as, as dangerous, so this is where you use your emotions to really overcome the thoughts that, well, I didn't do it yesterday, so why are we doing it today, which is almost an instinctive reaction, so if you think that well how will I feel if I'm getting up earlier how will it feel to get up an hour earlier and maybe if I was the kind of person that found getting up early really easy what would the rest of my day look like because if you're going to get up an hour earlier well maybe for that person they would have quite a defined evening routine they wouldn't wait until for example they felt tired they would have a set bedtime which is quite rare, but one of the most powerful things you can do. And maybe because, you know, you're getting up an hour earlier, maybe you don't want to disturb the rest of the house. Maybe they'd move some of their workout clothes or whatever else it was to another room. So it's really easy to get ready in the morning. And once you think about, okay, what what's the kind of person, what kind of behaviors do they have that find getting up early really, really easy? It's never just a matter of, putting the clock an hour earlier it's actually becoming a person that behaves differently throughout the day I know for myself I quite often um, I was up at 3 30 this morning for yeah. 4 o'clock a.m. call and I know that my preparation for the evening starts around 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon on those days it's not just a matter of falling into bed and, and, and turning the alarm on and I, I'm going to you you hinted earlier about the coffee story and I, I love this story because I I had a a client who had great reasons to get up early in the morning but she just couldn't emotionally bring herself to do it so we brainstormed and I said look what is it what is it about your morning let's let's leave aside the what time you get up what is it about your morning that you really really look forward to that you feel excited about and she said oh well I love my coffee I said well who doesn't but (laughs) can we work with that so she she lived in this really cute two-story apartment and the kitchen was downstairs and her, her bedroom was upstairs. But she figured out a way she could put on fresh coffee on a timer and she would have the coffee brewing 15 minutes before her alarm went off. So when her alarm went off and her, her arm flung out on autopilot to, uh, to hit snooze or turn off her phone, she smelt coffee. And because she loves coffee, it was an emotional reaction. It wasn't, oh, I'm going to get up early and be a better person. It was like, oh, there's coffee downstairs. So she, um, led by her nose, she would get up, roll out of bed, go downstairs to grab a cup of coffee. And then she was actually awake and she couldn't go back to sleep. And she started. And once again, her self-esteem was, oh, wow, I've got up early and I've got a coffee. Today is starting really well. 
So she found it easy to become the person who, who got up an hour earlier. So you can use all sorts of emotions and tools rather than just telling yourself this change is a good idea because everyone says I should do it. I, 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 you know, I love that. that that's, 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 I think that's an illustration of the opposite of a flabby imagination. <laughs> that this is this is she used her imag or well you and she together used imagination to create a way to do things and make your changes last. And talk to me a bit about imagination. How do you see imagination working in this process? Oh, I'm so glad you've asked about this, Charlie. You asked the best questions. This is really this is the difference between having the future you want and not, to be blunt. So Imagine, imagination, most people imagine, okay, I'll, I'll be direct, they imagine the wrong way. So if they're imagining themselves in a situation or imagining um, themselves in an exhilarating situation they want, they quite often imagine themselves as though they're watching themselves in a movie. So they kind of looking at a blurry version of themselves doing this great thing. So it's a difference if, let's, let's go back to Olympic athletes, my favorite, but if you're imagining that you're getting a medal at the Olympics, the most usual way is to kind of imagine yourself and maybe you see the crowd and you see yourself stepping up on the podium and getting the medal. That's flabby imagination. If you oh, that's flabby imagination? Own, it is because you're not experiencing all the emotions you're not experiencing it as yourself. So the other way to do it is to actually, even if you're closing, closing your eyes and sitting still, and everyone can do this along with us right now, but you feel one foot step up on the podium. You feel the other foot. You look out at the crowd. I've got my eyes shut now, so this is really cool. You look out at the crowd and you see them and you can feel your head turning and you see them. You feel the ribbon around your neck you feel the weight of the metal as it sits there. And that kind of imagination is more than a 10x experience. And because, and there's all the science about it that um, is in my book as well, but if you imagine it that way, your subconscious brain can't tell the difference between your imagination and what is actually happening. I've heard that, that's, um, and that's fascinating. And there's, there's even um, there's a couple of experiments, and I won't geek out too much on the science now, but they put some, some college, the good old college students, they, they put their perfectly healthy um, wrist in a plaster cast so it could not be moved. And some one group was told, look, just do what you normally do. Just wear the cast and we'll cut it off in six weeks and fine. But the other group were told to imagine their bones getting stronger and to imagine the muscles clenching and growing stronger. And of course, their, their arm is in plaster, so you can't actually contract your muscle if it's immobile. But that group, when they took the plaster off, their muscles had actually grown stronger. Just Serious. through their imagination. Through, the, through imagination. Yeah. yeah. There's so many things about the power of the mind that is just mind-boggling if we, would, if we could only... Um, um, access that. Now, Ellie, you have one of, one of the things that, that you suggest in Feeling Forwards is you have sort of to creating these changes that can stick. You have five questions. Can you, can you, maybe, maybe five is a bit long, but could you pick the, the three that you think would really impact people if they ask these questions daily? Isn't that what you suggest, that you ask these questions daily? Yeah, absolutely. Because Talk to me about if those. You, yeah. Look, if you start the day thinking about or creating the day you want to have rather than let the day happen by random accident, you have a completely different experience. So every day I ask myself, and these are the big ones for me, what will, what will I look back on tomorrow next month, next year, what will I look back on that I was really proud that I achieved today? And achievement is a, is a broad word, but it could be something you start. It could be something you don't do. It could be something if you, if you have 
a very um, strong imagination and you have imagined the kind of life you want to enjoy, if you're making a not so great choice on how to spend your time or what you choose to put in your mouth in that moment when you're feeling grumpy, um, and you, you stop and you think, well, am I going to be proud that I did this when I look back on it? And if the answer is no, just don't do it. Now that is, let me just comment on that because I think that is very, very powerful. What can I do today that I will be proud of in the future? And what might I do today that I would not be proud of in the future or that could be limiting for me? And, you know, mm. I, I, I think I need to look at both of those, don't you think? Yeah, no, I, lo I love that you've you've seen the the distinction between that because it's it's subtle, but it's it's really really powerful because it, I I think it's also had some huge benefits in in mental health, particularly the second one because you think, will I seriously, will I really be worried in one year's time? Will it be important? Will it matter what this person said to me, even if there's someone close to you? Will it actually matter? Will it matter that my my train was late or is late for a meeting? Will it will it matter that um, I, I wasn't able to get this done or someone let me down? Is it really that important? Because most of the time it it really isn't. But what it does do is it chews up a lot of emotional energy you could actually oh. be spending to move yourself forward. Yeah, just a huge amount of emotional energy. I'm. I like to remind people, I say, you know, I could probably say one month ago, but I, but I frequently say one year ago today, you were extraordinarily stressed and frustrated about something. There, there was something that was really bothering you. Can you tell me today what that was? And they can never say that. <laughs> they, 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 they can't tell me that because they've not processed it. It's just they've let it go into the emotional negativity bag that is inside of us and and it just it just you know keeps reawakening these demons and these monsters that we don't need to deal with when we're thinking positively in our imagination about about what we can do that matters i i i i love this idea what can i do today that i'll be proud of tomorrow a month from now a week from now whatever it's it's a brilliant yeah. question what's your next one my next one, one of my favorites is who can I lift up today? And I allocate what I call 15 minutes of kindness to to reach out to someone. And it's, I, I write this down in my journal, so it's always someone different. And look, someone, sometimes it can be a family member. If I'm spending some one-on-one you know, -on -one time with, with a family member, it can be someone I haven't spoken to for a while. It can be a, a colleague that I've heard of is going through a hard time or sometimes I, I just really love doing something like jumping on LinkedIn or Instagram and just commenting on five people's posts, not necessarily my followers, not necessarily anyone I'm connecting with, but you know, there's a lot of people who are doing the best they can with what they have. And I know when I was starting out in, in writing and, and, and speaking, the occasional kind word from a stranger had the most enormous impact. And particularly when I was going through cancer and people would just you know, squeeze my arm or, or just smile and not even say anything. So reaching out to other people, paying it forward, lifting up the world around you is, a, is another way to, to really feel as though you're creating a future that you want to exist in. I've stated several times that probably, I don't know, probably, I, I hate to say my most important value because tomorrow I'll say what else is most important, but a supreme value for me is kindness. And... And I have found the more in the last, you know, five, six years, the more I've, I've focused on kindness to other people and being nice, saying nice things. And, and if, if they do something really outstanding and it impacts me or it impacts somebody else, you know, it just takes five words to say, man, you really made a difference in that person's life. Or you really helped me with that. You, you know, you know how far that goes. That is, you just made a person's day. 
Yeah. And you know, Charlie, going back to your earlier point, I can remember, particularly when I was very, very unwell, I can remember every kind stranger I met so much more than I can remember when someone said snake something snaky at work or you know, a friend that's no longer in my life, I can barely remember, did something. I, I actually can't remember those, but the kindness, um, just someone taking the time to lift you up, I mean, that's, that's something I can remember so clearly from decades ago. I have a, um, I have, I, I have, I have a kindness test. Do you know what my kindness test is? I watch people. No, I'd love to hear it. And I, and I, and I try to, I really try to practice this myself. How do you treat sales clerks? Like when you go to a clothing store, do you pick up the clothes and just throw them back down on the rack? Do you, do you, are you kind to the sales representative? Or even your grocery clerk who's checking out your grocery, you know, just a couple of nice words. You know, I always, I find something to say to them that just kind of makes them chuckle. And, you know, and you know what I find? They look forward to having me in line next time because they know, yeah, they know they're going to get, they know they're going to get a, 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 an encouraging response. Um, I have taken, you know, in the Bible, there's a, um, there's a statement that, you know, Jesus is asked what's the most important things in, in life. And he says to uh, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. I've turned mm. that into two statements, and that's believing in God or in, if it's for you, a higher power, the source, the universe, believing in something outside of yourself that works in harmony with you. And secondly, believe in believe the the first is to believe in hope that there is outside help but secondly where love your neighbor i just say be nice that's what you know what does love your neighbor mean i don't know what that means i don't know what love means and i'm a theologian um but i'll tell you what when i say be nice i know what that means yeah yes and 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 being nice and kindness is, is universal. And I love that you've, I love you gave that example about the, the grocery store clerks because you know, you make conversation. You see someone who was looking tired and harried, and you make them smile, and you see their their shoulders straighten a little bit, and then of course you feel good about yourself, and then you make yeah. good decisions. I hadn't thought about that, Ellie, but that is true. When I am kind. I feel better about myself, you know, and it's really, my goodness, maybe it's an ego-centered deal, I don't know, but but I do feel better about myself when I'm kind to to another person, and 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 you know, you get that you get that other response. Now, look, you've given us two of your five. Do you, do you have a, another one or two that you want to tell us of your five yeah, questions? Sure. Let's, the other one is I, I look at what my intention is for the day because um, I'm certainly never going to say, um, oh, I use feeling forwards and I have a great day every day because life happens, right? Whether it's a, a domestic crisis or technology challenges, which is one part of my work I don't enjoy as much as others. So depending on what kind of day, I know I've got lined up. If, if it's a day with lots of interviews, then it's... it's um, understanding and connection and that's my intention and that's my intention for the day but if it's a day of, of crunching out some content or then my my intention might be consistency and so if my my shoulders do drop at one point during the day it's like okay I'm just gonna get one more thing done I'm, not, I'm just gonna be consistent I might not feel like laughing and dancing about it right now but I know being consistent is going to give me the rewards that I want I think anything that you can do to to choose your feelings, to choose your approach for the day, helps you stay on track and on an even keel when life happens as it does in all its glory. You know, we did a podcast about a year ago, and there was a statement that you used is that you can choose the you you want to be. It is it is a matter mm. of choice, and then obviously actions that reinforce that choice, but it begins with a choice of understanding who do I want to be, and and not that I want to be president of a company or a greatest entrepreneur or sell the most. I you know I I live in character development, and 
Who do I want to be character-wise? And when I am that person character-wise, then my successes are not so successes in the, in the world of work or the world of, of accomplishments mean much less if my character makeup is what I want it to be. Yes. Yes. So let me and ask you, you. Oh, go ahead. Go mm-hmm. ahead, please. No, and then and then you know when you reflect on your day, I I, I teach a technique which is not in the five questions, but I call it reversing the to do list. So it's so easy to fall asleep at night thinking about everything you didn't get done, right? Um, it's you know when you're brushing your teeth, it's like well re- reflect on everything you you did get done, and what you did start, and that that grocery clerk who was looked really miserable and you left smiling and then you go to bed feeling great about yourself and you'll you'll wake up in a much better frame of mind as well so it it, it all interconnects i concur totally i have two questions left one is a very easy one but so how would you summarize what does it take to make the kind of changes that stick. What, it, what is the difference in making a change that doesn't stick and a change that does stick? What are the, what, what are the, what are the primary differences in, in approach? Firstly, it's, it's, you can actually, you have the, the, the power, the emotional power to make any change you want. And it's not about thinking it through. It's about feeling feeling it in your body and making it an overall package because the the life you have will be determined by the behaviors that you show. I love, I might have shared this story last time, but the, one of the most beautiful illustrations of this is um, twins that were interviewed by a reporter and identical twins, obviously same family background, same circumstances, same age. But one was homeless, one twin was homeless and one was a very successful and wealthy business person. So the reporter asked them each a question and he said to the homeless twin, well, to what do you attribute how your life has turned out? And the homeless twin said, well, my father was an abusive alcoholic. There was, there was never any hope for me. I had no choice but to have this life. And the reporter asked the, the second twin, well, to what do you attribute how your life has turned out? And the, the successful business person twin said, well, my father was an abusive alcoholic. I had no choice but to, to create the life that I, I enjoy now. And all it was was, was feelings. What you, what you feel becomes real. What you focus on determines your, your future. And we all do. And I'm sure there are many people listening that have had greater trials and, and tribulations than I have. But you know, I've, I've been in a fatal car accident. I've had cancer. I've had a few other very colorful things happen. And you can you can choose your way through that, even though it's hard. I'm sort of reticent to say, but some people think, you know, I was a decent father. Um, and I came from, I'm adopted, and I came from two fathers that were horribly dysfunctional and did nothing mm-hmm. to support me the way I needed support as a as a young psychotic young man because I went through so many so much traumas it as a young child you know through the ages up until about eight years old and I determined I learned from my father's what kind of father I did not want to be and I was not going to do that to my son and so there was a whole different, and it, and, it, and it wasn't just a very permissive, oh, you can do whatever you want to do. No, there were, there were boundaries, there were hard lines. But the one thing, the one thing that sort of overrode any other actions was love. I never wanted this child to ever question that he wasn't loved. You know, we used to, I'd, 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 I'll close my end with this because because it's such a great story and I don't think I've ever told it publicly. We used to tell. Oh, my well, s- what's that? I mean, all tribute to you. All, all, I mean, I, I love that you've you've been so vulnerable, and I feel so privileged that it's happened during my interview. But I, I wonder whether that is partly 
responsible or explains the insight and the empathy you have with people, which is quite extraordinary. Oh, it it, it is. Let, let me let me tell you what we used to tell our son. We would we lived in a in a in a neighborhood, and we would say, if God were to line up all the boys in our city in San Juan Capistrano, we would travel down Golden Ridge Lane and this street and that street. And there was just a line of hundreds of boys. And God said, you could pick anyone you want to pick. Your mom and I would go through that line. And every single time it would not fail, we would pick you. (laughs) And, you know, we still use that today on occasion. And he still gets a big, you know, 30 years old. He still gets a big smile on his face. Because he just knows he was that special. No matter what child was out there, this is the child we would pick. That is so beautiful. And, you know, I reckon if uh, Austin said if all the dads were lined up in all the world, he would pick you too. Oh, gosh, Shelley. How sweet. Thank you. You know, as, as we're wrapping up here, I would like to know, you have such a superb website, and we will have that in the show notes. And we will have your book in the show notes so people can go to your website. Is there a way to use your website to walk through this process of of creating changes as stick? Oh, that's a cool question. There's a couple of there's a couple of free worksheets on the website and also you can get through my Instagram account. If you go into my bio, there's heaps of um, free sources. There's the top five questions to create your best future that we we highlighted some of those. There's also a create your future checklist. So if you're looking at how to, what's, what are the kind of signposts and what, the, what are the decisions I have to make to, to choose what kind of person, I, the person who has the life I want, what behaviors there might be, there's a, a checklist you can start to work through. And of course, anyone's free to, to reach out and ask me any questions um, there's a direct email through my website or DM me through Instagram, and I'm I'm always happy to help. Can you give me? Will you send me your your Instagram address so I can post that? Yeah, absolutely. Because I am lame. I I am ultra lame in social media, so I don't even know how to go to Instagram or LinkedIn. Is it LinkedIn or Instagram? Um, look, I can send you. I can send you everything. Okay, send me everything, and we'll just put it on. Um, Ellie Gould. You are just way too cool for your own good. <laughs> Thank you. You've lifted me up. This is your more than 15 minutes of kindness, Charlie. I feel fantastic. <laughs> oh, thank you. You're, you're such a fan, fantastic and, and insightful guest. I, I, I want to thank you so much. We've, we've highlighted how we can get in touch with you, and we will certainly do that. I want to thank you so much for being on the show with me today. It's been an absolute treat. Um, I'll be in California in a few months and we'll have to connect then. Well, you said that last time and you didn't connect. So I'm holding oh, you to it this was time. The pandemic. It was the only the pandemic that kept me. Okay, time. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but let's connect. I, I'd, love to, I'd love to have you meet my family or meet my wife. We could perhaps we could find dinner, time for dinner or lunch or something. But it'd be delightful to catch up. Yeah, that's a promise. We'll do it. Okay. I also want to thank our listeners for tuning in to the next chapter with Charlie. And until next, this is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now. 